This show is going to be pivotal if you have a family history of breast cancer, if you're worried about breast cancer, if you have hormonal disruption, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, whatever it is, you'd be shocked. And when I go over these statistics about how many women are diagnosed and die from breast cancer. So breast cancer, as you know, I have a, a one degree uh, separation from it, from my mom being diagnosed with breast cancer when I was younger. And uh, the diagnosis of breast cancer is something that was my first experience with it. Now, I want you to think about immediately. Do you have a first degree relative, a sister or a mom who's been diagnosed? Or maybe a cousin? Or I then think about if you know any woman ever in your life who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Most people listening know someone in some way who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Are they survivors or did they pass away? These are important questions we need to ask ourselves. Now, my first experience was with my mom, really. I, I knew my aunt had it and my grandmother, but my real first into the world of cancer and breast cancer was with my mom. And after pursuing and going into oncology and doing my residency, that's when I was really shell-shocked because I started seeing patients who were 21 with breast cancer, 24 with breast cancer, 30 with breast cancer, even people my age at the time, 32 with breast cancer. And I was under the impression that most of breast cancer was coming postmenopausally, at least in my firsthand experience. But immediately you see the difference. And I'll never forget this one girl always, always, always was at the top of my head. She stayed with me. And this was at the beginning of 2016. And I had this patient. She, was, she had a two-year-old and she had a newborn, like two months old, a two-year-old and a two-month-old. And she was 21 years old and she was just diagnosed with stage four triple negative breast cancer, aggressive. And she ended up dying in six months. I remember getting the email and seeing like, these are the people who, uh, who were within the hospital have passed away and she was on the list and that really shocked me because that was, it was so tragic, right? She was a new mom. She has a, a one month old, a six month old when she died. And to think, wow, she's not the only person in their 20s who've had breast cancer. So it's so important for us to listen. So we're gonna go over some of the statistics, um, some of the things that we're seeing overall so you understand what's going on. And then gonna give you some recommendations. What do we know in the evidence? And then what do we know that is not yet in the evidence, but we're having inklings of that this is really, really important. Okay, so breast cancer is the most common cancer in women, regardless of race or ethnicity. And as per the CDC, in the year of 2020, there was 239,612 new breast cancers reported in females. 42,273 females died from breast cancer. From 2016 to 2020, about two in three female breast cancer cases were diagnosed at the localized stage. Okay, this means that the cancer hasn't spread outside the breast. It is local to one area. This has about a 98% five-year survival. In about one in four female breast cancers, those were found to be at the regional stage. This means the cancer has spread to the nearby lymph nodes or a nearby tissue or a nearby organ. This has an 86% five-year survival rate. And about 6% of the cancers that were found were found at a distant stage. That means the cancer has gone through either the circulatory system or the lymphatic system and is spread to different parts of the body. This has about a 32% five-year survival rate. Now, one in three of all new female cancers are going to be breast cancer. And there are more than 3.8 million women with a history of breast cancer in the United States right now. This includes women currently being treated and women who have finished treatment. The average risk of breast cancer is going to be one in eight. The incidence rates of breast cancer have increased about half a percent per year, but the death rates have decreased since the late 80s. The American Cancer Society estimates for breast cancer in the United States in 2023 that about 297,790 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women and 55,720 
of the new cases are DCIS. This is ductal carcinoma in situ. You remember I just spoke about hasn't left the breast tissue. And this is important to understand because there is some controversy behind it, right? This is the precancer. These are the abnormal cells that they find on mammals. And they're in the lobules of the breast. They're confined there. This is technically called stage zero. And the progression to becoming cancer is highly variable. And I say controversial because there's some doctors in disagreement that, no, we should actually wait to see from stage zero before anything happens, before we even treat it with chemotherapy or radiation. But there's the risk of that stage zero progressing to cancer. But remember, I said it's highly variable. So a lot of people ask, should I be doing a mammo then? And... I'm not here to tell you not to do a mammal. I think mammals uh, have a lot of benefit. In fact, uh, they detect cancer. They're very sensitive at detecting cancer. The issue with mammals is over time. One mammal is not going to expose you with this dose of radiation that it's going to cause cancer. But what happens is if you start doing mammals at 30 years old, and you go all the way to 70, 75 years old, and you're still getting mammals every single year, um, the cumulative exposure to radiation can start becoming significant. So it's something to think about, but it's also something to talk about with your doctor. I would never, never recommend not getting a mammal. It's believed that 20 to 30% of stage zero, right, the, the abnormal cells become cancer. And if there's no treatment, it can even be higher. So I say that because if you are to stage zero, I think it's a good idea to have multiple conversations with multiple oncologists to get a good idea. About 43,700 women will die from breast cancer. That begs the question, when it comes to genes, how big of a role do genes have in breast cancer? Well, if you have a first degree relative, like a mom or a sister who's had breast cancer, you're 50% more likely to have it yourself. We talk about the BRCA2 gene, right? And it's incriminated in approximately 20% of hereditary breast cancers. So it's good to get that checked. I wouldn't say it's good to go as far as getting both your breasts removed. I think that there's other things that can be done and talked about that Angelina Jolie surgery was, um, for me, very extreme. Um, but it's, again, you have to talk to multiple oncologists, talk to an integrative one, talk to a traditional one, see the spectrum of what you're going to learn. Because a lot of the time when you're diagnosed with cancer, you're already put straight into the system. And oftentimes you don't have a moment to think. And before you know it, you're laying on a table and getting radiation burning and chemotherapy bags when you're sitting in a chair and feeling like crap. You really have to make an informed decision. Now, one copy of the BRCA2, if you have it, can have a 30 to 40% lifetime risk of development, and it can even be higher for some people. The effect of the genes are most likely confounded by multiple things, but nothing short of the most important one being epigenetics. So this is why I said it's kind of extreme to get a double mastectomy like Angelina Jolie did when we're not thinking about the role of epigenetics. And when it comes to cancer overall, epigenetics is more important than genetics. About 5 to 10% of cancers in general are going to come from a genetic nature. Now remember, if you have a first degree relative, your risk is much higher genetically, but there's a major role in your epigenetics. This is why it's so important. So it, remember, 80, 85, even 90% of it is what's going on outside of your genes, right? Your environment, the stress, the food, the exercise, the alcohol, all of these things that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Most breast cancers are not hereditary. I'm going to repeat that. Most breast cancers are not hereditary. They're not coming from genetics. Now, your risk factor increases with age. You can see the graph of the diagnosis of breast cancer, and it goes about from 20 years old to 25, and you go the increments of five years. And But once you're at 70, 65, 70, 75, 80, it just it goes really high. So it's pretty low before the age of 30, and then it increases linearly till about 80, and right around 80, it then plateaus. But I want you to think about this epigenetic aspect again. Generally speaking, 
the population in Japan is much healthier than us, much healthier than Americans. They have a healthier diet, they have a healthier lifestyle, they have healthier connection to nature, healthier connection to community systems, all the things that we sort of are trying to do now. Japan's got a lot of it figured out and they have a high amount of, I think I think it's at Osaka, high amount of centenarians there, meaning people over 100. They did a study and they showed that it only took one to two generations from a seemingly low risk population, people from Japan, let's say, uh, I think it was a, a family that moved from Japan or, or a few women that moved from Japan that they followed and they transplanted to Hawaii which had American ideals, American way of life. And it only took one to two generations before the rates of cancer matched the rates of the host country. That means it only takes a generation or two generations until you come from a healthy community that has a low cancer risk to come to America, which has a higher cancer risk. It's pretty crazy. What else is really a important risk factor? Alcohol intake. We have to think about that. I've done a few shows on alcohol and we know that uh, every single drink of alcohol is cumulative. It, it accumulates and increases your risk factor. No amount of alcohol is safe. We thought you can just drink a low amount of alcohol and it's fine, particularly for the brain, particularly for your hormones. Those two are important. Now, if we think about hormones being disrupted by alcohol, then we think about hormonally driven cancers, which are Cancers like ovarian cancer and cancers like breast cancer. This is why it's important to understand the role of your hormones. And breast cancer is driven so much by estrogen disruption. Body mass index, which isn't the best measure to go by, but in the research, we see that a 34% increase in risk of death from breast cancer comes when you have a body mass index over 30, especially waist circumference being a big indicator. Hormonal replacement therapy, exogenous synthetic hormones. We see that it increases your risk of cancer for five years and then it falls. Radiation may play a role. Uh, getting your period early is important to understand. If you had a period, if you got your period earlier than the population, than your friends, it's something to think about because when you are exposed to your hormones elevating at such high levels, um, over time, once a month, but for a few years, I think mean for many years actually until menopause, then there's an increased risk factor. Also, if you're over 35 and pregnant, another risk factor for breast cancer. One important recommendation I like to make when I was working in cancer and seeing so many breast cancer patients is picking a day. You have to pick a day from the month to check your breast. You have to learn how to have a relationship with your breasts and under your arms and to check for any abnormalities. Now understand, your breast tissue is going to change. It's variable, especially around your period. But you also have to be very clear about what changes are when and if month to month you find a nodule that's not moving. If it's fixed, if it's hard, if it's growing, it's something that you really need to pay attention to. And it can happen at any age, breast cancer, 20, 30, or 40 years old. Now, you heard my recommendation on mammograms. I do think women should get mammograms, but also you can complement them with something called a thermogram. Thermography is important because it may show early on where there is a risk for cancer in the body. So you want to combine both, and it's really powerful, especially if you have a first-degree relative with breast cancer. No surprise here, smoking like alcohol, very important. There's a increased risk. It's not as high as you think, but there is an increased risk for breast cancer. You wanna make sure you are working out. You wanna make sure you're building the most amount of muscle. Fitness, being fit is one of the most important factors at preventing breast cancer. When you have a poor amount of skeletal muscle and a high amount of fat, what you're doing is increasing the amount of extra gonadal bioavailable estrogens. You're increasing your estrogen. With this elevated amount of estrogen, remember I told you a huge risk factor for breast cancer. And it's also associated with high amounts of insulin, another risk factor for breast cancer. Increasing the amount of IGF-1, another increase for breast cancer. So you have to understand, one of the most powerful things that we can do to prevent breast cancer is just get fit. Increasing your amount of skeletal muscle, reducing the amount of fat is going to go a very long way. Now you wanna do both aerobic and anaerobic. You wanna do muscle building and making sure you're doing cardio. 
And we see multiple randomized controlled trials showing the importance of exercise on insulin, immunity, hormones, inflammation. We see data with that on breast cancer. And you want to have an elevated intensity of working out. You don't want to do super moderate, low level. You want to make sure you're building and challenging your body with that hormetic stress. If you're worried about breast cancer, you might want to do a Dutch test. A Dutch test is a really powerful test because it shows you your estrogen metabolism. Remember I said estrogen is a driver of breast cancer. You want to make sure you're checking for, in particular, 4-hydroxyestrone. That is a downstream breakdown product of estrogen. And when you see that in a level above 11% of your broken down estrogen, then it's cause for concern. You want to make sure you're bringing that down and you can retest through interventions that I'm going to talk about shortly. If you're worried about breast cancer, one of the most important interventions you can make is removing xenoestrogens. These are chemicals found in plastics. We want to make sure that we're avoiding those because they mimic estrogen in the body. Remember what I said about clearing excess estrogen in the body. That carcinogenic form of estrogen can cause DNA damage. If you're being exposed to BPA, that is a driver of hormonally driven cancers. You want to make sure you're removing plastic bottles, canned foods, dental sealants, unfiltered water, thermal paper. Those are the things that are acting like xenoestrogens and binding to the estrogen receptor, and not only binding to the estrogen receptor in various tissues of the body, but also blocking and binding other important healthy hormones. But you'll also find those xenoestrogens in cosmetics, makeup, synthetic fragrances, materials in your home that are off-gassing, cleaning supplies. Hormone disruptors are found everywhere. So you want to make sure you're doing the necessary things to start phasing them out of your life. In the research, the most protective diets against breast cancer were the plant-based diets, Mediterranean diets, right? Reducing processed foods, increasing the colors of the rainbow, reducing insulin resistance, getting away from that pro-inflammatory carcinogenic state. You want to make sure that you're eating the variety of all the colors of the rainbow. When you look at the research, this is the research that is most important at reducing your risk for breast cancer. Forget about the trendy diets out there. This is what we see. On the topic of insulin resistance, we want to make sure we're eating with our circadian rhythms. There was a study from Hong Kong that showed that breast cancer increased by 50% in over 1,500 subjects if the food consumed was after 10 p.m. at least once a week for more than a year versus those that didn't eat like that. Why? Because it's disrupting your cortisol, your melatonin, and your insulin. You want to make sure, you want to make sure that you're eating with the circadian rhythm. You don't want to eat too late. Also, that brings me into fasting. The rule of thumb, especially when it comes to breast cancer, is fasting about 13 hours or more. That means you can do it intermittently. Make sure your last meal is, let's say, at 7 o'clock, and then your first meal is at eight, nine o'clock. That doesn't mean fast the whole morning. When women were fasting under 13 hours, the increased risk of dying from breast cancer was increased by 21%. So can fasting help prevent breast cancer? There is some evidence that fasting or reducing the blood sugar intermittently is going to be beneficial at reducing the risk for breast cancer. In the women with breast cancer, when there was fasting under 13 hours, there was a 21% increased risk of dying from breast cancer. And after 13 hours, every two hour fast lowered HbA1c, that is overall blood glucose levels over a few months. And as we know, in metabolic disruption, elevated blood glucose is going to be a high risk factor for any cancer, especially breast cancer. One of my favorite foods to put you in the best place of preventing breast cancer is cruciferous vegetables. These are sulfur-rich foods which support liver metabolism of estrogen, breaking down that hormone, and it gives signals for detoxification in the body. Indole 3 carbonyl is found in these foods and it stimulates the detoxification enzymes and thus promotes our hormone breakdown. Now, how do you eat cruciferous vegetables like kale, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts? Well, the best is to eat it raw. Now, most of us can't eat it raw. I can't. I for sure can't. So as a hack, what you can do is cook it. What you do is cook it, you steam it for about six, seven minutes, just break it down a little bit. You don't want to put it directly into boiling water. You want to steam it and you want to make sure you're replenishing. You're replenishing it with 
mustard seed powder. Now, this is an old hack that I've been talking about for a long time, but it goes a long way. When you replenish it with mustard seed powder after you steamed it, you're replenishing the enzyme that is producing that indol 3 carbonyl because about 50% of it is going to be gone in the process of cooking within six minutes anyway. So one of my favorite hacks is adding mustard seed powder to already cooked cruciferous vegetables. One of the strongest cruciferous vegetables you can have out there, the most powerful one overall, is broccoli sprouts. You want to reduce added sugar, preservatives, refined carbohydrates, trans or saturated fats. You want to go for organic food, of course. Now, a lot of people ask, is tofu going to give you cancer? Is it going to disrupt your hormones? The answer is no. It's actually protective to the human body. We have to understand that the soy isoflavones are protective in breast cancer. It reduced breast cancer, especially in postmenopausal women. We see this having a protective effect in Asian populations. What happens is the way that soy works in the body is that it binds to estrogen receptors, but doesn't have an estrogenic effect. It's a phytoestrogen. What it's doing is it's binding to the estrogen receptor and blocking and protecting the cell from xenoestrogens binding to the hormone receptor, like BPA, like we see in pesticides, like we see in a lot of these chemicals that we're inundated with. So in fact, soy in itself as a phytoestrogen is protective against hormone disruption, not causing it. You gotta make sure you're pooping. If you're worried about breast cancer, you have to think about how often you are moving your bowels. What happens is bile acids conjugate those hormones, they wrap them up in a bow and you poop them out. But if you're not pooping, that bow gets unwrapped and that estrogen is reliberated into the body. It can cause a major issue over time, especially. You gotta make sure your bowels are on point if you're worried about breast cancer. And this happens because of microbes in the estrobilome. The gut bacteria that is capable of metabolizing estrogen, they produce an enzyme in your gut called beta-glucuronidase. This breaks down or deconjugates estrogen into its active form, and that recirculates right back in the body. So when the gut microbiome is healthy, this collection of bacteria produces a balanced amount of this enzyme. When it's dysbiotic, and there's a lot of constipation, this enzyme activity may actually be altered and begin recirculating that unhealthy amount of estrogen into the body later down the line, putting you at risk for estrogenic forms of breast cancer. You wanna make sure you're eating fiber, reducing amount of inflammation in the body, turmeric, resveratrol, quercetin, genistein, EGCG, selenium, DIM. Those are all supplements. Talk to your doctor that are really powerful, making sure you're getting green tea in the body. As I mentioned, EGCG is so powerful. It inhibits the tumor processes and proliferation, protects your DNA, reduces angiogenesis. That means the blood supply going to the tumor. It's an antioxidant in the body. You wanna make sure you're getting a good amount of sleep, if you're getting poor sleep, it's increasing your risk for cancer. If you're getting under seven hours, you're increasing your risk. Under four hours is a major increased risk. Moving with nature, moving with your, your circadian rhythms, you wanna make sure you're sleeping in pitch black because melatonin and cortisol are important. They are antagonistic hormones. Your cortisol is down, your melatonin's up and vice versa. Melatonin is protective against cancer, especially breast cancer. Melatonin is disrupted by irregular sleep rhythms, fluorescent light, night shift work. We know that it's a, it might be a, pro, it's a probable carcinogen if you're working in a night shift. Israeli studies show that women who sleep longer reduce the risk of breast cancer and they close their shutters. They reduce the risk of being exposed to artificial light, strong illumination. You wanna make sure you're sleeping in pitch black. Vitamin D is so important as a protective uh, intervention for breast cancer. If you have a vitamin D level of 60 and above, you have an 82% lower incidence of breast cancer versus those who have under 20. You wanna make sure you have connection to nature, connection to other people. Community plays a major role. You wanna have a sense of purpose that's less studied, but very important. Magnesium is very important for methylation or metabolism of estrogen in the body. Magnesium plays a major role. One of the most important supplements for hormonal balance. 50 to 75% of us don't even get enough magnesium. B vitamins are very important, especially B2, B6, and B12. You need that to break down estrogen, especially in phase one and phase two. For proper just estrogen metabolism, hormone metabolism, you need a good amount and a robust amount of B vitamins in your diet and or through supplementation. 
Other things that we need to talk about is just oral contraceptives. There's some observational studies that show that there's an increase when you're taking it, but it drops down about 10 years after. So you want to be very much so aware that if you have a history of oral contraceptives, your risk of breast cancer can increase for about 10 years. Gut health, you want to make sure you're detoxing, making sure your gut is good, you're pooping, as I mentioned, every single day, removing the toxins from your home, increasing uh, your awareness of air quality, air purifiers, getting clean couches, clean beds. These are things, don't get too overwhelmed now, that happen over time, but you don't want to understate the importance of making sure the air is clean in your house the off-gassing of chemicals and mold. Mold, mold, mold. This is something that's being studied more and more and it's implication in breast cancer. I actually think part of the cup that was being full for my mom comes from uh, mold that we had. I think that uh, when we had the uh, water pipe break downstairs uh, when I was younger and uh, we didn't know about remediation that way, it actually increased the health issues in the household. Uh, my brother getting pneumonia, my mom a few years later getting breast cancer. I started developing psoriasis after and skin issues. So uh, mold plays a major role, major, major role. And I want you to think about it. And I really want you to get your home remediated or checked if you worry or if you have a risk of breast cancer. And lastly, the emotional component. There's so many theories behind the emotions driven and that drive breast cancer. Um, nothing concrete yet. I don't believe anything will ever be concrete because it's two different forms of studying, the energetics and the physical manifestation. In my experience, what I see is that women who carry shame around sexuality, um, anger against father, father wound is a major one, um, repression of uh, or womb, something with the womb, whether it's an anger or sadness held in the womb, whether it's an abortion, a rape, a molestation, even a surgery, when there's things carried in the womb, oftentimes I'm seeing a lot of women manifest that with breast cancer. These are my findings. You take that with a grain of salt, but understand that emotions are a major, major, major part of cancer. The two things that people don't talk about are environmental toxins and emotions. I talked about environmental toxins for many years. Now I'm talking about emotions. The two of the major causes and, and, and factors for cancer are there. Two things we don't know enough about. And I really want you to know that yes, repressed emotions do drive your state of stress, your hormone disruption, your immune suppression, and then ultimately the manifestation of cancer. Amongst other things, it's multifactorial. There's many things, but do not overlook emotions. You have to look at your emotions. Upon diagnosis needs to be the number one thing you need to think about while getting treated. So I really hope that helped. This is the Breast Cancer Show. We're doing our best to prevent anything long-term. Take these recommendations, bring them to heart, write them on a whiteboard, stick them on your bathroom, stick them in your kitchen, stick them in your room, wherever you need to remind yourself what you need to do to protect your breast. 